Today we're going to talk about crisis and austerity. So we're going to talk about crisis in general, but mainly the 2008 crisis and what caused it, and then the austerity policies that have followed in different forms in different uh, European countries mainly, but also North American countries, and how these kind of resemble a lot of the kind of reforms that have been asked by the IMF and other international institutions in the global south for many decades. Now, first of all, what is a crisis? What makes something an economic crisis? We have a recession, right? So that instead of having growth in the economy, we have negative growth. So GDP, the gross domestic product, goes down rather than up. GDP being what is made uh, in, in the economy uh, in, in one year. We have many crises of financial crisis, right? So they come from the financial system. That was certainly the case with the 1997 Asian crisis, and it's the, it was the case in the Argentinian crisis uh, in 2000, and uh, it certainly was the case with the 2008 crisis. All crises are caused by kind of boom and bust, so this goes back to uh, the first crisis, capitalist crisis, which was in tulips in the Netherlands in the 17th century, uh, which was uh, basically there was a boom in the price of tulips. So lots of people got into wanting to sell tulips, and then the prices crashed, and uh, there was a big, uh, big crisis. So something becomes very profitable. So lots of people get into it, uh, to selling it, and then that deflates the price. So that causes a bust. There's nothing new there, right? That has been going on for a long time. So you have this distinction between what happens in the financial system and then how that affects the real economy. Okay, so this crisis in 2008 certainly started in the financial system. It was, it was banks that were in trouble, uh, but then through the bailouts and other means that transferred over to the real economy. And that's when it results in unemployment and poverty and, and so on. So those things didn't happen straight away in 2008, but they have happened uh, in, in the aftermath. So then there is a question about whether crises are unavoidable in capitalism. So up until 2008, there were certainly a lot of people that thought that the period of big, large crisis was over, right? It wasn't. A way that economists often look at crisis is they think about it as linked to the impossible trinity. So a lot of crises historically have been caused by countries seeking to do all three at once. So if we think of the period um, after the Second World War, before this kind of changes in the, in the 70s, um, we had fixed exchange rates between countries, like so uh, the dollar was pegged to gold and uh, all the other currencies around the world were pegged to the dollar. Um, we had independent monetary policy, so central banks, well, or in countries could have their own in independent monetary policy. We did not have free movement of capital, okay? So we had capital controls in place. There was more and more capital being moved as part of globalization uh, that, um, that we've talked about in previous weeks. So as part of, part of that, we have more, move, uh, more movement of capital that states struggle to keep control of. Then that was a big cause of the crisis in the, in, in the 70s, right? So that then the, the way out of that was to leave the fixed exchange rate, right? It basically broke the exchange rates. So each country have their own kind of history of, of, of a crisis there. Then the, what became the norm was to have free movement of capital and to have independent monetary policy, but not to have fixed exchange rates, right? To have floating exchange rates. If we think about uh, the, what happens inside the European Union, or rather inside the European Monetary Union, so in the Euro area, uh, we have, obviously fixed exchange rates uh, in a way, and uh, we have um, free movement of capital, but countries in the euro area do not have independent monetary policy, right? And that has been a problem for countries like Greece, Spain, Italy, Ireland, that would have, had they had the chance, would have done, uh, led a different in monetary policy than what the European Central Bank has done uh, in, the, in the crisis. So then if we think about what actually caused the global financial crisis in 2008, Susan Strange, a very good British political economist, wrote a book in 1986 already where she warned about casino capitalism and what it was doing. A very good film that explains the casino capitalism that took place in the lead up to the 2008 crisis is The Big Short. You should watch it. So mortgage-backed securities 
which were the kind of cause of the financial crisis, are basically, you get a bunch of mortgages, right? Home ownership is increasing fast in the US, in Spain, in, uh, in Britain. Uh, in Spain, you had 85% uh, of households who were ne nearly were homeowners. In Britain, 70%. Um, so all these mortgages that, uh, that people are taking out, they are bundled up together. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of good mortgages here, good customers. <laughs> and then the longer the, um, this boom goes on, the more lending banks want to do, right? So we, it's important if you're going to have a rising housing market that you get um, uh, that, that you get more and more people joining the housing market, right? Home ownership is something that is good to promote. But what that means, because at the same time as having uh, an expanding housing market, so more and more people, households uh, becoming homeowners, you also have less job security, right? So, you know, you have uh, the job security in general has been going down. So what that means is that you get people who want to buy properties, who and who the bank, who the system kind of needs in order to expand the system, needs them to buy properties, right? But they are the, 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 they are becoming more and more precarious. Okay, so they're in more and more precarious situations. So that means that in these products of mortgage-backed securities, you also have some subprime mortgages, right? Now this becomes a bundle that is traded on financial market, and that's what they talk about. But although the immediate lender that lends the money knows about these risks, right, and these customers obviously pay um, a higher premium because uh, they are seen as bigger risks, when this is traded on financial markets, the people or the investors trading in it do not know exactly what's in here, right? So then, and then that, then they, they trade on the risk of these being defaulted. So basically, you have these mortgage-backed securities then that becomes doing business on the risk when these are traded on financial markets, but at the same time hiding the risk. This is supported by risky, risk, riskier lending to more and more precarious borrowers. Uh, so if this is the problem that causes the crisis, and if you think that, you know, that it's the lending, the irresponsible lending to, uh, to households that really should not be borrowing that kind of money. So if you think that these kinds of things are the problem that, uh, that has gone uh, wrong, then what we need to do is to regulate the financial markets. So where there has been a lot of deregulation, what we need to do is to re-regulate. And that is you know, largely what, what happened. That was Obama's response to it. That was the response of G20 was to um, increase that re regulation. Much of that regulation has then been removed by Donald Trump's uh, administration in, in the US. But there are other sort of deeper reasons that you can see for why the crisis took place. And one of the big uh, ones that have, have gained a lot of traction in recent uh, years is that actually inequality was a very big cause in itself of, of the crisis. And that's not least thanks to Thomas Piketty, uh, which wrote this book, uh, who wrote this book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century where he, sh he looks at a number of countries, at a lot of in-depth data, basically showing that inequalities have grown globally, okay? This is not a problem in the US or in just in the US or, or in Europe, but it's true in China, uh, it's true in Japan, it's true uh, in a lot of uh, big uh, economies around the world. Okay, so what he then says is that inequality in a capitalist system, inequality is self-reinforcing. Okay, why is it self-reinforcing? Because it makes more sense if you have a lot of money and you have a very unequal society, then if inequality means that there's a lot of poor people that don't really have much buying power, much purchasing power, then it doesn't make sense, as much sense to make, to invest your money in things in producing things that they could buy because they can't, right? Because there is not that what's called demand there in the economy. So it makes more sense 
for, if you have a lot of spare cash hanging around, to invest it in um, rentier, profit-seeking, uh, so rent-seeking rent activities, so land, uh, housing, or uh, speculative investments of, uh, of, of different kinds, uh, whatever they may be. Um, and what he also says is that capitalism naturally has tended towards rentierism. So we have this trend towards global inequalities that has always been part of capitalism, with the one exception being in the post-World War II period. So Piketty comes to the conclusion that actually the only, you know, the only thing that has ever, ever reversed this was war. Okay? So that is uh, his uh, rather dire uh, assessment of uh, what would uh, need to happen. On the reading list is uh, Stockhammer, Engelbert Stop Stockhammer, who uh, also argues that inequality, uh, he very explicitly says that inequality caused the global financial crisis. Um, and he says that there are four uh, ways in which that happens. Right, so uh, first, drawing on, on the same kind of thinking that Piketty uh, says is that it causes a, inequality decreases the demand in the economy. Okay, so there is less people able to buy stuff, so there's less demand in the, in the economy. And the people, what happens in inequality, because it's not as many people that get rich as people that get poor, but you have fewer people being rich and more people being poorer, right? So uh, uh, the people who would spend money, um, are, uh, who spend all the money they have, are at the, are at the bottom. Um, and they have less, so therefore there is less demand in the economy. This kind of stagnant demand has led countries, he says, to become either debt-led, such as the US, the UK, Spain, uh, or export-led, uh, such as Sweden, Germany, uh, China. So countries have come to specialize in either um, and this kind of path dependency or being, having their economies driven by debt or having their economies driven by export. And in the debt-led economies, the spiraling household whole debt uh, has yeah, gone out of control and you know, partly to keep up with social consumption norms. So you know, what in this country is called kind of keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, so that was happening uh, leading up to the 2008 uh, crisis, you say. But also, at the same time as that happening, you also have an abundance of money at the top. Um, and that incredible abundance of money then makes the people who have it more likely to engage in risky financial speculation. And risky financial speculation obviously has, uh, makes for the kind of systemic risk that we, uh, that we just saw in the video clip. So if, if inequality is the problem, well, then it's not enough to regulate financial markets. Okay? So if inequality is the underlying problem that causes crisis, then regulation is not going to address that. You need a radical redistribution of, uh, of wealth. Then you have uh, a more Marxist critique uh, of uh, th what happened, which is that, so yeah, the inequality has have increased, that's because of neoliberalism. Uh, so uh, David Harvey would say that, you know, you have crises are always recurring in capitalism. They're built into the capitalist system. Most crises historically have been of overproduction, so that, uh, you know, there's been too much, too much production. Um, uh, of a certain good that has been in, in a boom, uh, but uh, that this crisis now is rather because of over-accumulation, that there's too much money being kept uh, at, at the top rather than going into production. Uh, a version of this is uh, the German Wolf, Wolfgang Streck, who's written a couple of books in the last few years. His main argument is basically that capitalism simply does not provide enough for enough people to sustain it democratically, okay? So in the, we, that it can't be sustained democratically because it's so, uh, it's so unequal and does not benefit uh, enough people. So that we will either see the end of capitalism or the end of democracy. So he would use that as an argument, see, well, this is why we have the rise of populism 
uh, across uh, so many countries, right? Because there's not uh, enough, capitalism doesn't provide enough. So if you go down that line, then you become an anti-capitalist, uh, basically. Okay, so now we're going to talk about austerity, which has been the major policy response in a lot of countries uh, to the 2008 crisis and has dominated, uh, dominated policy making uh, in many countries in different ways, uh, as we will see. Um, so first of all, I'd just like you to uh, put on Slido and tell me uh, what is austerity? What does it mean? Talk to each other if you want. <laughs> you don't have to remain silent. Just talk to each other and say, what does, uh, what does austerity mean for countries, for people? What is it? Yeah, so uh, we've got a lot of good answers here to what, what austerity is. So, yeah, it's about reducing the fiscal deficit, right? So the difference between uh, the government expenditure and uh, the income uh, in, in, an, in any given year or time period. Uh, so then um, uh, decreasing, uh, yeah, cutting down on public spending, right? So it is... Um, that is what, what the way that, that uh, you try to reduce this uh, fiscal deficit, uh, that you cut down on public spending. Um, policy aimed to reduce debt by government. Uh, okay, so that's almost right. It's not quite debt that we're cutting by austerity, but it's the debt, it's the aiming to uh, cut the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, we'll go into uh, why, why that is. Um, a misunderstanding of macroeconomics. Uh, you can, uh, so some people certainly say that it is, and we'll, we'll go into that. Um, spending cuts or tax increases. Yeah, that's true. It can also be tax increases. Um, in uh, some taxes have been uh, increased. Class warfare is certainly one uh, reading of what austerity is. Um, fundamentally flawed. Uh, that is uh, the dominating, in macroeconomics certainly, and political economy, the dominating reading of what austerity is. So austerity as a word uh, means kind of self-discipline, uh, thrift, scarcity. So what we're doing with scarce uh, when, when, when we are through a period of scarcity. Um, in the political economy, uh, austerity means basically shrinking state expenditure uh, with the stated aim of decreasing the debt to GDP ratio. That's different from decreasing debt. Okay? The debt, nobody really realistically thinks that we can decrease the amount of pounds or dollars that a country uh, uh, owes. Okay? So, but the debt to GDP ratio uh, is what, what we're trying to uh, decrease. So that um, is a percentage. So before the crisis, a lot of countries had GDP ratio, uh, debt to GDP ratios of about 50%, and then they were kind of bumped up to <clears throat> about 90%, uh, and uh, some of them have gone uh, a lot higher than that uh, since then. So the case for austerity uh, is uh, generally led by uh, conservative politicians or um, uh, the Troika, for example, of the um, uh, European Commission, the uh, European Central Bank, and the IMF. Um, well, the IMF has got a lot of people in there that do, are not too keen on austerity uh, anymore. Um, this is the kind of political case for austerity by one of the most colorful British politicians. Ici, no. Suppose that I were funding an extravagant lifestyle on credit. That my bank was allowing me to hire an expensive sports car, get a mortgage on a huge house, and then it stopped lending me the money. At that stage, my quality of life would inevitably change. I could go on as many anti-cuts marches as I liked. I could protest and demand growth, not austerity. I could call my bank manager a heartless Tory sociopath and it would still make no difference. I would still owe what I owed. Because austerity is not a choice. It's a reality. 
Our whole vocabulary here is wrong. When we talk about an austere person, we're describing a personality trait. We're talking about someone who is stiff and spartan and frugal. But in the case of the United Kingdom, austerity is not a choice. It's a response to external circumstances. And it's the inability to see this that creates what is perhaps the most irritating three-word slogan in the whole of modern politics, namely growth, not austerity. I mean, honestly, comrades, if it were that easy, don't you think we'd have all tried it by now? Unfortunately, when as now we have a small majority, or indeed a hung parliament, you find that profligacy becomes the order of the day. Votes become pricey, pork-barrelling affairs, and each time that a cheque is written, you invite 20 new demands. If you can afford a billion pounds for Ulster, you can afford HS2. If you can afford HS2, you can afford a proper public sector pay rise, and so on and so on. And that, I'm afraid, is the situation that we face as long as this majority persists. But none of it affects the fundamental economics. The United Kingdom is still spending more than it earns to the tune of a billion pounds a week. In that situation, Austerity is not a choice. Austerity is a fact of gravity. So that then is kind of the case for austerity. Uh, if you look at uh, the key to, to uh, Daniel Hannan's case here is that just like a household would, right, the state must live within their means. Okay, so we need to tighten our belt. Now, very importantly, no economist would say it like that. Okay. Uh, but, and we'll get back to why, why that is. So that is not a scholarly argument, but you would hear, you do hear politicians uh, saying that, okay? Um, then if you look at what has been used as the kind of scholarly arguments for austerity, uh, there are two main ones. And one is, uh, well, based on a uh, article that came out in 2010, um, that said that a high debt to GDP ratio, uh, in fact, th that is detrimental, has a detrimental impact on growth. So they studied a bunch of countries and uh, looked at um, the effect on, on a high de uh, debt to GDP ratio and found that at the line of 90%, then it becomes much harder to grow the economy. Okay? So that states should try to stay under that 90% barrier. And this was at a time when a lot of states' uh, debt to GDP ratios were around 90% or a bit over, okay? Um, then you have the Expansionary Austerity School, uh, a group of uh, Italian scholars um, that uh, basically say that actually, again, by looking at what different countries have made, they looked at sort of Netherlands and, and Denmark, for example, in the 80s and 90s, showing that, well, that we can have fiscal adjustments, so we can have austerity, so cutting down on expenditure can be a good way of achieving growth, but particularly when it's combined with tax cuts. So somebody said earlier that austerity could be to increase taxes. Well, they, what they are arguing is that actually we need to cut expenditures at the same time as we cut taxes, okay? And then we can have uh, this kind of uh, expansionary austerity, so we can have growth even though we are um, um, we are cutting expenditure, we have an austerity. Now, in uh, reality, we've had most European countries have had some form of austerity since 2010. Um, so you have, uh, you can put them in two kind of categories. You have Greece, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, and Italy uh, that have had uh, Troika involvement, okay? So the uh, IMF, the European Central Bank, and European Commission. Um, that has been called, uh, by Liam Stanley, has been called disciplinary austerity, okay, when it is to some extent uh, forced from outside. Now, some of these countries have had actual austerity measures enforced on them, and some of them have had just involvement in the, uh, like Spain and Ireland mainly, uh, reforms to the financial market, but that nonetheless, uh, the financial system. Um, but they've had this kind of external pressure uh, that you can call disciplinary austerity. Then you have uh, other countries like UK, Netherlands, France that have had what he called anticipatory austerity. Okay, so that we're not uh, talking about that it's forced from the outside, but it's the British government uh, itself that decided to uh, have, have austerity. Uh, in the US and Canada, you've also had a significant austerity, but uh, the, that particular term, particularly in the US, has not been used uh, as much uh, more, more in Canada. 
Now, then, going on to the critique against austerity, right? And we'll, you can see this at different levels. One of them you can see is an empirical critique, right? which is basically just looking at what is happening with austerity and saying it's not working. Okay? So austerity has failed to deliver stable or significant growth uh, right now, you know, particularly in Greece. You know, Greece is you know, nowhere near uh, anywhere recovered. It's a uh, transformed country, much for the worse. And you know, with no clear sign of uh, of, of that changing, um, but rather that it's been a huge uh, radical reform uh, of the Greek state. Uh, that's what uh, austerity uh, has been there. Then you look at this. You de then scholars have dealt with these particular claims that were made on the previous slide, right? So, for example, the 90% debt to GDP limit was proved. It was actually proven although it was doubted by many scholars when, when that article first came out, it was proven a few years later by a PhD student, I think, at Cambridge, who uh, showed that actually it was based on miscalculations. Even the basis for that claim itself was basically wrong, right? Uh, and the authors have admitted as much, uh, as much sense. So there is no kind of magic limit where debt to GDP becomes, uh, becomes particularly problematic. Um, Nobody would say that it's good to have a high debt compared to GDP, right? Nobody would say that that's something to strive towards. Uh, but what most economists would say, most macroeconomists, is that no growth is a lot worse than, uh, than high debt, okay? So that what we need to focus on is growth. So if you think of the, the relationship between debt and GDP as being the problem, it's a lot easier to increase growth than to decrease debt. Right? Easier to increase GDP and to decrease debt, and therefore it makes more sense to um, to focus on uh, on that. Um, they also critique. There's also a lot of critique against the concept of expansionary austerity, and uh, saying that is that that is based on poor research methods, uh, and that actually when you look at it, you can't see uh, any cases where you can really say that austerity has led to growth. Uh, so we're in a situation where a lot of economists that work for the IMF uh, and uh, IMF themselves uh, often uh, express that there is, has been too much austerity and that it's actually been counterproductive and that it has stifled growth. Still, IMF is part of the Troika and are also you know, pursuing austerity policies in many parts of the world. So you can't say that IMF as an institution is entirely against austerity, but there's certainly uh, a lot of people within it that, that are. Um, and the kind of consensus in uh, macroeconomic circles is that it's not working, right? So that's kind of looking at what's happening and saying it's not, it's, it's not working. Then you have a theoretical critique of austerity that tries to explain that, you know, it's not just that austerity isn't working, it's that austerity cannot work, okay? So those claims are kind of different. One is just looking and saying it's not working. The other is saying, well, it's not working because it can't work. Um, and they largely are largely based on, on Keynes and Keynesianism. And you have some of the sort of key authors uh, here that have, uh, have written about uh, austerity. So um, he says that comparing households uh, to states is a fallacy of composition. Okay? So the states and households do not have the same role in the economy, okay? Households can't make money to start with. The state can make money, okay? Uh, and um, in, in a state, uh, everything that, you know, money goes around in a state, right? In a, in a household, once you've spent it, you've spent it. But in a GDP, the same pound coin can, is counted several times, right, uh, in, in a year. Uh, but um, uh, so, it's, you can't really compare uh, those two things. So austerity is not working uh, because it can't, because it misunderstands the role of the state as an engine in the economy, uh, which is what Mark Blythe says. And that is because it doesn't understand the multiplier effect. So in a national economy, I'm the state, I decide that teachers are gonna get a pay rise. Now, because teachers don't make a huge amount of money, they tend to spend all the money that they have, right? So I'm paying you as a teacher uh, money, you then go out and spend that money, so that's already that money has been spent twice, right? 
same money been spent twice. And then that enables Patrick here to go and uh, have some home improvements. So he uh, builds, uh, gets a builder in to uh, build something uh, in his house. And uh, that then uh, gives another, uh, so that money goes around another time and so on. At some point, the money leaves the economy, right? And it depends on the economy of a country how, um, uh, how strong the multiplier effect is. Okay, so in, obviously, if you then go and buy something of Amazon with that money, then probably it leaves the system or something, right? So um, at, at some point it finishes. But there is a multiplier effect there. That means that one, one pound that the state spends becomes more than one pound in the economy. So what, uh, what Keynes said and what Keynesians say is that the time for austerity, so to cut time, state spending, is, is the boom when things are going well, not the bust. Because when we have a crisis, when we need growth, that's what we need is to, for, the, for the state to spend more money and to take on more debt. Um, then they also say that, so we can think of a lot of, uh, when we talked about inequality being, being a problem, that is what a lot of Keynesians uh, would say. Uh, so that, that, that inequality was a large thing that caused the crisis. So austerity worsens inequalities, right? It deepens inequalities, and therefore it basically does exactly, exactly the wrong thing. Austerity. It's big in Europe. It's getting big here. Everyone in the Prime Minister has been talking about it. But what is it? It's the common sense on how to pay for the massive increase in public debt caused by the financial crisis, mostly through the slashing of government services. First you take on debt, then you pay it off. Sounds simple, right? Unfortunately, it's never that simple because austerity confuses virtue with vice. Let me explain why. Now that supposedly the worst of the crisis is over, there's debt everywhere. Credit cards, mortgages, government debt. This is the part you know. But we need to remember how we got here. Two years ago, the world's financial system exploded. The crisis blew a $2 trillion hole in financial space-time. And collectively, the rich governments of the world spent, lent, or guaranteed between 5 and 50% of their country's annual products saving the banks. Given this, you might think that a period of austerity is a good idea. But to see why it's not, you have to think about the world as a series of balance sheets. I, I know. Stay with me. Whether you're a person, a household, a firm, or a state, you have assets and liabilities. A balance sheet. Before the crisis in 2008, everyone took on a lot of debt. Back then, it made sense for many of us to take on debt. For example, the bottom 40% of the US income distribution hasn't had a real wage increase since 1979. Really, that's true. Corporates, especially banks, did the same. But they did it to make money rather than to pay the bills. It's called leverage which is pretty much debt seen from a different perspective. Levering up is a little like going double or nothing in blackjack. If you've taken on debt from a mortgage, you hope your house will increase in value. If you think there's a high chance the value will increase, you might go double or nothing and take on a bigger mortgage. But like blackjack, there's always the risk of losing. So the banks created mountains of debt. They levered up 20, 30 times. It was like they'd pushed in all the blackjack chips but each chip was just an IOU. So when it all went wrong, governments felt they had to step in and bail them out because they'd become too big to fail. This is where the balance sheet problem comes in and why the common sense of austerity is not so simple. If you're levered up in debt and your assets lose value, your house or your housing derivatives portfolio if you're a bank, your balance sheet as a whole is now underwater. When this happens, whether you're a corporate treasurer or a single mom, if you've got cash coming in, you'll want to pay down the debt to bring your balance sheet above water rather than spend money, which means no one is spending. And that's when the government comes in. If the whole private sector is deleveraging, paying back debt, then government automatically levers up to compensate. Tax revenue falls, so the deficit increases. Unemployment benefits kick in, and public consumption takes the place of private consumption. Now make no mistake, the problem is debt. There is too much of it across the board, and we need to clean those public and those private balance sheets. But all these pieces are connected. If the public sector cleans its balance sheet at the same time as the private sector, then the whole economy craters. It's called a fallacy of composition. 
what's good for any one household or firm or even state is a disaster if we all try it at once. So why then have most governments of the world decided to do exactly this and all at the same time? Well, remember that two trillion dollar hole in space time? The answer is that someone has to pay for it and no one, especially the banks, wants to. So governments have to either increase taxes, difficult, or slash services, easier, especially when the policy has the common sense ring of virtue about it. Austerity, the pain after the party. But here's the kicker, the hangover of austerity is not going to be felt the same across the income distribution. Earlier this year, the Forum for the Governments of the World's Most Economically Developed States, the Group of 20, called for growth-friendly fiscal consolidation. Which, like a unicorn with a bag of magic salt, is a nice idea but is pretty much bull****, precisely because this consolidation doesn't hit everyone in the same way. Remember those folks in the bottom 40% of the income distribution that didn't really benefit from the financial boom? All they got was debt and the illusion of prosperity? They're the ones that actually use government services, those services that are about to be so virtuously consolidated. Those at the top end of the income distribution, those who made the mess in the first place, don't. So where does this common sense virtue of austerity leave us? It leaves us in a cycle, where those at the bottom end of the income distribution pay for those at the top, with the same stagnant and skewed incomes that now buy less in a more unequal and unstable economy. There's a term for this, class politics, and it usually ends badly. This common sense of austerity, of reducing public debt all at once through slashing services, involves a question of equity. Who pays and who doesn't? Those who made this mess won't, while those who already paid for it through the bailouts will pay again through austerity. This is why austerity is not common sense. It's a nonsense and a dangerous one at that. Okay, so the fact that if everybody cuts uh, <coughs> spending at once, then the growth is not going to come from anywhere, right? And um, you have a lot through austerities that you, we have when government are trying to cut the, down on their debt to the GDP ratio that ends up with households taking on more debt, right? So uh, in um, most of these countries, household debt has increased um, uh, quite dramatically since uh, in, in austerity. Um, it also, from a Keynesian perspective, makes a lot more sense if we're going to pump in money to the economy. It makes a lot more sense to pump in money at the bottom of the income ladder, right? Why? Because the multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect is a lot stronger if you give money to people who are going to spend it than if you give money to people who are not going to spend it, okay? So that means that, that basically, if we want to get the economy going, we want to do it in a way that decreases inequality by, by pumping that money in at the bottom. And that's quite different from what has happened. We'll look at that. So then there's a political critique against uh, austerity, right? So this is kind of a theoretical economic critique. You have a political cr critique that Mark Blythe goes into as well, but it says that you know, the crisis was caused by Wall Street. Right? So it was caused by Wall Street, by mortgage-backed securities, by the, by the trade. Um, in, in these securities, uh, but sub, the subprime crisis. So it was caused by Wall Street. So it's simply wrong to make those worst off in society pay the price for it, right? It's just morally wrong. Um, then uh, what Wolfgang Strake would ar argue is that it's divisive, right? It causes, causing this level of poverty and, and inequality is divisive and it causes social un unrest, which explains the, the political crisis um, in, in many countries. Um, and that you know, it's morally wrong to cause this much uh, dispossession. Okay? So today it was released that one third of British children live in poverty. Okay? One third of children in Britain live in poverty. Uh, uh, those those come, come out today. So you, know, you have the increase of child poverty so that that kind of dispossession is, is just wrong. Um, then, and, and that comes on to that the cost of austerity is unequal, right? So it hits the already disadvantaged groups harder. And I'll come into that when we talk about the concept of urban austerity in a second. Then you have thinking about a lot of, a lot of scholars think of austerity as a, fundamentally neoliberal, right? So that Jamie Peck 
calls it sort of an intensification of neoliberal restructuring strat strategies. So a lot of things that were already kind of happening have kind of been, been intensified. Philip Morowski came up with a uh, famous book in uh, a few years ago now that is, says never let a serious crisis go to waste. So he draws on thinking by Milton Friedman uh, that talks about you know, how we can use crisis to make the previously impossible things politically possible and that austerity represents that. So that austerity is actually something that a lot of people have wanted to involve cuts that a lot of politicians or political forces have wanted to do for a long time anyway, and the crisis uh, enabled that uh, through, um, through austerity. So in that sense, they would ask, you know, is austerity actually meant to solve the crisis, which you know, it isn't doing, or is it rather used in order to kind of restructure the state, re -aim, change the way that the this, this state uh, works? And in that sense, is austerity meant to create growth? which you know, it isn't, or is it meant to protect the profits? The crisis happened because the states bailed out the banks, right? So that's how the GDP, debt to GDP ratio uh, ex went increased by so, so much in, uh, in such a short space of time was uh, because the banks were bailed out, right? So uh, the profits of the financial sectors were kind of uh, were protected. So is that uh, what uh, what austerity is, aims towards. Um, and an uh, article by Green and Lavery show, drawing on this, that you know, if we want to, cr uh, to produce growth, we should pump in money at the bottom of the income ladder. Well, what's happened? The, the pumping that has happened through quantitative easing has gone straight into the financial sector, right? And who benefits from the financial sector? Well, they show that in this country, it's about the five, top 5% 5 of UK households benefit when the financial industry grows growth, right? And they show that the shares of the, of, of the banks in the financial sector uh, grew um, after each round of, uh, of quantitative easing in, in this country. Then Jamie Peck develops uh, an idea of austerity urbanism, where he basically says that it's in cities where austerity is felt more than anywhere else. So it's here that we have the housing slump, right? So the, the sort of crash in housing prices and evictions. Uh, uh, that, that follow from that. We also have that in, in, it is in cities where people are more reliant on public services. Okay? He also says that cities are home to many of preferred political targets. So we can think of the undeserving poor. Austerity has been I suppose, politically enabled different in different countries. Okay? So in Spain, for example, it was just like saying, We've got to do this. It's not that we want to do this. We just have to have to do these cuts because uh, we are forced to by outside forces, right? Uh, but in Britain, uh, when austerity was brought in, it was uh, there was a lot of um, uh, talk about sort of benefit cheats and uh, that people were living off benefits so they didn't have to work and so on. So a lot of basically talking about undeserving poor. Uh, and they tend to be more concentrated in cities, and so are the minorities and marginalized uh, population. So for Peck, cities are where austerity bites. He also says then that it is city governments that deliver austerity. Okay, so a lot of the spending cuts comes down to local governments to do. Um, and that's, so it's, in that sense, austerity is downloaded to, to cities. Um, we have, uh, again, in this country, in, in the UK, we have uh, uh, also uh, the idea of localism being driven by uh, uh, the coalition government and then the, uh, the conservative government, that uh, that, for Jamie Peck, becomes a, w a way of sort of passing the buck down. Okay, so we'll talk about it in terms of local democracy, but with much less money to do anything, so uh, it becomes a kind of pretext. And the effect is that it deepens equality between, inequality between cities. Because some cities are large, they have different sources of income, uh, different kinds of access to credit, and different kind of uh, leverage to cope better with, uh, with the crisis, or on their own rather. They have different uh, abilities to cope with less money from, uh, from the state, uh, whereas other cities uh, have fallen behind. And that's very visible in the US. We have you know, cities like Detroit going bankrupt, uh, whilst other cities like you know, Los Angeles with different kind of economy doing you know, 
all right, not suffering as much from that kind of thing. And you have the same thing in Britain, with some cities being much worse off. Um, and Bristol actually, you know, doing fine uh, in in many ways. But obviously, com in comparison. But obviously, if you look at uh, you know inequality within Bristol, uh, that has. Um, has increased uh, dramatically, but Bristol is, is better positioned than some other, other cities in, in the country. But certainly that it also the, it drives in, deepens inequalities within cities, right? Because as uh, kind of state support uh, is, uh, is cut um, whilst finance and other assets grow. So um, housing prices have been increasing, right? So the people that are plugged into the housing market have kind of on, in total been uh, been doing all right, uh, whereas the people who are not uh, have So in Britain, you've had a large, uh, largely grown inequalities between homeowners and uh, non-homeowners. Um, and one study by Cunningham and Savage in London showed that it's uh, people that work in business and finance and legal have been winners, and other sectors have lost, uh, lost out. And they show that looking at where these people live in different parts of uh, of London. Now. We're going to have a little quiz. So, telephones out, please, and go into kahoot.it. And you should be able to enter this code. Right, I'm going to start now. So, which bank's downfall became a symbol of the 2007 2008 crisis? Yes, most of you got it right. It was Lehman Brothers. Which country has the lowest home ownership rate in the EU? Tricky question, right? Okay, we think of Germany as a rich country. We think of homeowners as rich, but Germans has the lowest rate of home ownership in the EU. They are an export-led economy. If you have a high rate of home ownership, there's more debt in the economy. Uh, and uh, so, so you have much more consumer debt, and that's not the way that Germany wants to go down. Uh, so they are, uh, yeah, about 40% uh, home ownership rate in Germany. The highest home ownership in the EU is Romania. Uh, Sweden, uh, sorry, UK has got about, uh, had 70, about 70%, but that has been going down uh, since the crisis, probably closer to 60 uh, now, something. But yeah, Germany has the lowest home ownership rate and there is, that is connected to the way that their economy works as part of it. Jack, where's Jack? Well done, Jack. Try to keep it up. How much do Chinese households save as a percentage of disposable income? These are the stock images offered by the app, so. Right, a lot. Basically, Chinese households save a lot. 35% of disposable income it goes into savings. How much do British households save as a percentage of disposable income? It's actually less than 0%. It's minus 0.9% of, uh, uh, of disposable income is saved by the average British households. That obviously is unequal, right? Uh, I mean, the people at the top obviously save a lot more, where the people on the bottom go a lot more minus. Uh, so, right, we can see that it's built on a different kind of economy, right? This is a debt-led economy in Britain, uh, whereas the Chinese economy is very much export-led, okay? Simon, well done. But ja Dan just hit answer streak four. Right, which G7 country has the highest debt to GDP ratio? Right, tricky one, obviously Japan by about a mile, it's like 250% of GDP or something like that. It's uh, sky high, uh, it's been going up and up and up since the uh, Asian crisis in, in 1997. Um, Italy is, is also very high. Uh, and the USA is, and you, all, of, all of these countries have high debt to GDP ratios, yeah? Is, is Japan export? Uh, 
I'm no expert on the Japanese uh, economy, but I think that it's an, it's, you know, an export-led economy. If we would look at, for example, the amount of household savings that Japan uh, has too, it would, uh, they would look also save a lot per household, not as much as, um, as the Chinese. Uh, but no, it's, it is more of an export-led economy. So, uh, but yeah, it's basically, but at the same time, the industry has been in trouble since you know, the crisis in 97 and has never recovered. Um, so they are basically staying in, with, in a high, high debt to GDP uh, situation. So more than double the rate of, of the UK. What percentage of Greek youths are unemployed? <laughs> right, most of you right there, 43% still. So, hence, a lot of talk about a lost generation, not just in Greece, but in a lot of, uh, a lot of Southern Europe, uh, with very high unemployment. So, it was much higher at the height of the crisis, but partly because a lot of young Greeks have moved to other parts of, the, of, of Europe, um, it, is now, uh, it is now lower, but still 43%. Simons? Still in the lead. Which country has the lowest unemployment rate? Right, not many of you got that right. UK has a very low unemployment right, rate. You wouldn't think it, but UK has a lot of underemployment, right? So people are not working as much as they want. People are, they have a lot of in work poverty in the UK, uh, which you wouldn't have in Sweden. Uh, but, um, uh, but in terms of actually registered unemployed people, the UK are lower, is lower than all of these countries. <coughs> it's narrowed, the lead has narrowed, but it's there. Who is, who is the managing director of the IMF? It is indeed Christine Lagarde. At the recent uh, international summit, there was a good picture of all the world leaders, and it was Theresa May and Christine Lagarde, were, I think, the, and Angela Merkel were the only women uh, in there. Uh, so, um, yeah, Christine Lagarde has been for a few years now. Right, who wrote Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea? Have you paid attention, basically? So, yeah, Mark Blythe. That is arguably the most cited book and famous book about austerity. He was the guy who was talking earlier, who building up a safe lead there, JS. But right, who is not part of the Troika? Yes, it's the World Bank. So the Troika is European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the European Commission. Uh, the World Bank is not. So. JS won it. I'll get you a prize after a bar of chocolate or something like that. Uh, well done. Right, that is all for today. I'm more than happy to take questions uh, outside or uh, whatever. Thank you.